Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a new one. This is going to be for the months of July, August, and September of 2017, entitled The Gospel in Galatians. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about the history of the Christian Church, that should uh, raise all sorts of flags. There's got a lot, going to have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about in this series of lessons. This first lesson is entitled, Paul, Apostle to the Gentiles. It's our lesson for July 1 of 2017. And we would like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we talk about these very basic and very important questions regarding the gospel, as we see them presented in the book of Galatians, may we come to know you better, may we understand more clearly the part that we need to play in helping to finish this gospel is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we know a few things about the history of Paul, who, of course, was the author of Galatians. He was born as Saul, um, and you could guess why he was called Saul, because he was a faithful Benjaminite uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, and uh, his parents were of the Pharisees. There were never allowed to be more than 6,000 Pharisees at any one time, and there were a lot fewer than that Sadducees. We, as Christians reading the New Testament, we read about Pharisees and Sadducees so much we probably think that they were major groups. No, they were, they were a minor very small, in terms of numbers, a very small group of people, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, in terms of the total number of Jews that were in the world. But um, Saul was born in Tarsus, a city in the province of Cilicia. Cilicia is on the southern border of, of uh, what modern Turkey, um, not too far from Antioch, which is in Syria. So it's um, a hot place to be right now. Um, he was circumcised on the eighth day, he assures us, and strictly followed all the Jewish ceremonies. He was certain about the preeminence of the law of God and believed that the temple in Jerusalem was the center of his, that is, God's worship. He was certain, along with virtually every other Jew, that the soon coming Messiah would bring relief from Roman oppression. It was unimaginable. I, I want you to get a feel for this. It was unimaginable to Saul that a man executed by the Roman authorities and Jewish leaders as one of the worst criminals could have been the Messiah. Just unthinkable. Thus Saul was determined, in line with his strict pharisaical training under Gamaliel, to root out the followers of this ridiculous new religion. For a chronology of the book of Acts and the life of Saul and Paul, you can see our handout on our website in uh, www.theox.org under, the, under the, it's the handout for the book of Acts. Or you can look in the Bible Commentary, several pages, volume six of the SD Bible Commentary, pages 97 to 102. It gives you the full details of which we don't have time to cover in this lesson. But as we know, uh, God had very different plans for Saul, later to be known as Paul. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And you're picking out a Pharisee to preach the, go the Christian gospel to the Gentiles. <laughs> you know, anybody who had said that to somebody in the days of Jesus, they would have thought, huh? You must be crazy. You just must be crazy. Well, what, what happened to Saul? This is a familiar story. How did he have any, first have any contact with Christians? The first thing that we know about is the, uh, the encounter with Stephen, mm -hmm. the stoning of Stephen, the speech of Stephen and the stoning of Stephen. So Stephen was tried, well, not really, but sort of tried by the Sanhedrin and eventually stoned to death, and Paul was there holding the coats. Um, there's some speculation about whether they might have had some prior uh, 
in encounters. What what was that? What's that about? Do you remember? Why was Stephen being tried? He was preaching Jesus. Well, not only that, he was he was going to the synagogues, especially the synagogues that were assigned that were in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem area, that were Greek speaking. Of course, Stephen is a Greek name, so we don't know exactly where he came from. But it, he was, and he was the head of the seven deacons that were chosen to make sure that the Greek speaking widows would be treated fairly. So it's pretty certain that his primary language was Greek. But he went to these synagogues, Jewish synagogues, and he started arguing on behalf of Jesus. And no one could answer him. They tried everything. So who do you think might have gotten involved in that? Pharisees. Pharisees, and particularly the person we're interested in is Paul. It's very likely that Paul was one of the people who tried to argue Stephen down. Couldn't do it. Do you think that the reason that, uh, that Saul was stated as holding the coats of those who stoned him, would that be because he wasn't of age yet, wasn't a member of the Sanhedrin yet, and uh, well, was kind of a, an apprentice? Or that, that's what does what, that mean? Yeah, that well, that's, that's a coats? thought. The thing is, he actually says later, I voted against him. Yeah. He didn't vote against him after he was dead. He had to vote against him when he was alive, and he, as a voting member, he would have to be a member of the Sanhedrin, I think. So I, okay. maybe he just wasn't comfortable throwing stones, maybe he had a sure arm or something. In your notes, you mentioned, <coughs> pardon me, the synagogue of free men. I've never seen that before. What's specific about freed men? Okay, it's the, the, the idea that I have gotten from that is that this was a group of, of um, and some people say ex-slaves, but at least non-Hebrew speaking or not, not, non-Aramaic speaking uh, Jews that had come back to live in the area of Jerusalem from the diaspora, the, the scattered Jews somewhere that they came back. And, and so... Um, well, Stephen's sin was that he didn't focus on the temple and the Jewish laws and the fact that somehow or other Messiah is going to come and free us from Roman rule. Now, that's a, obviously a reason for condemning someone to death, right? What do you think was the most offensive to the Jews of that day? Claiming that Jesus was, in fact, resurrected. Mm -hmm. That certainly would have upset the, the Sadducees most of all, wouldn't it? Um, here's what Paul says in Philippians, um, a little bit about his history. It is we, not they, who have received the true circumcision. So Paul says, I was circumcised. For worship God by means of his spirit and rejoice in our life and union with Christ Jesus, we do not put any trust in external ceremonies. I could, of course, put my trust in such things. If anyone thinks they can trust in external ceremonies, I have even more reason to feel that way. I was circumcised when I was a week old. I am an Israelite by birth of the tribe of Benjamin, a pure-blooded Hebrew. As far as keeping the Jewish law is concerned, I was a Pharisee, and I was so zealous that I persecuted the church. As far as a person can be righteous by obeying the commands of the law, I was without fault. Wow. But all those things that I might count as profit, I now reckon as loss for Christ's sake. Not only those things, I reckon everything is complete loss for the sake of what is so much more valuable, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have thrown everything away. I consider it all as mere refuse so that I may gain Christ and be completely united with him. I no longer have a righteousness of my own, the kind that is gained by obeying the law. I now have the righteousness that is given through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is based on faith. So how's that for a testimony? Well, um, members of the Sanhedrin were, what do we know about them? They had to be at least 30 years of age and they had to be married. I suppose there's a remote possibility that Paul may, could have been exempted temporarily, assuming he would be soon married. 
But they married very young in those days, and it's, we just assume that Paul was also married. Um, Did they have to be a member of the Pharisees or Sadducees to be in the Sanhedrin? No. There were a few of the elders, what are sometimes called the elders of Israel, that were neither Pharisees nor Sadducees that were members of the Sanhedrin. But by far the majority of the Sanhedrin were members of either Pharisees or Sadducees. Yeah. Um, well, here's what Ellen White says about his part of what happened at that point. Prominent among the Jewish leaders who became thoroughly aroused by the success attending the proclamation of the gospel was Saul of Tarsus. A Roman citizen by birth, Saul was nevertheless a Jew by descent and had been educated in Jerusalem by the most eminent of the rabbis, and we know that was Gamaliel. Of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Saul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's the King James Version of the verse I just read. He was regarded by the rabbis as a young man of great promise and high hopes were cherished, concerning him as an able and zealous defender of the ancient faith. His elevation to membership in the Sanhedrin Council placed him in a position of power. Acts of the Apostles, page 112, paragraph 1. And then elsewhere she says, and this would be in the book of edu Education, with the faith and experience of the Galilean disciples who had accompanied with Jesus were united in the work of the gospel, the fiery vigor and intellectual power of a rabbi of Jerusalem. How do you like that description? A Roman citizen born in a Gentile city, a Jew not only by descent but by lifelong training, patriotic devotion and religious faith, educated in Jerusalem by the most eminent of the rabbis and instructed in all the laws and traditions of the fathers, Saul of Tarsus shared to the fullest extent the pride and prejudices of his nation. While still a young man, he became an honored member of the Sanhedrin. He was looked upon as a man of promise, a zealous defender of the ancient faith. So that gives us a little idea of what um, kind of a person he was. Now, we have, we have some hints that um, something happened to Paul at that time when they were, he was holding the coats and l listening to Stephen and assisting in his stoning. What was it we think might have happened to Saul at that point? Well, when Jesus confronts him on the road, he says, is it hard to kick against the pricks? Uh, in other words, okay. the pricks of conscience. So it uh, doesn't say when that started. Yeah. It might have, might have started there. Either that or maybe earlier if he was arguing with Stephen in the synagogues. But he, he, just, he just couldn't. Ellen White suggests that watching that experience and seeing Stephen look up to heaven and so forth, he couldn't put it out of his mind that there's something that this person has that I need. Something about him is just not like some criminal or some rabid uh, patriot of some kind. So Paul is struggling with this conscience. Um, he was, however, convinced that he was right. So think about what might have been going on in his mind. Now, let's just paint the picture here a little bit. He's given a document that gives him permission to act on behalf of the Sanhedrin. And they had, under the Roman system, they had considerable authority over Jews no matter where they lived. So now he's headed for Damascus. How far is it from Jerusalem to Damascus? 140 miles. About 140 miles. And who was he traveling with? Temple guards, wasn't it? The temple guards. They were, they may even have been Roman soldiers. They might have been Jewish soldiers or Roman soldiers. But strictly speaking, as a Pharisee, he wasn't allowed to speak to either one of those groups. So he was walking for 140 miles, thinking about what he's struggling with in his conscience. How do you suppose, do you think that prepared him for what happened to him just as he was ready to enter Damascus? Well, Paul was struggling because he could not believe that 
everything that his mentors and his Jewish instructors and the Sanhedrin had, had so vehemently taught him, he couldn't believe that they could possibly all be wrong. So how could this Jesus be the Messiah and all these people be wrong? It just couldn't be, you know. Well, well, and how could he be the Messiah if he was dead? Yeah. Because in their minds, he was dead. Well, they knew he wasn't dead, but they wanted him to be dead. <laughs> yeah. That, that's at least what they were yeah. preaching. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, do, are we so really committed to some ideas that we might be wrong about? Put that question to you out there. Couldn't be. Couldn't be? <laughs> Well, in the book just before Galatians, right at the end, in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he encourages us, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. Yeah. So the baseline is that Jesus needs to be in us and everything flows from that. If we're not walking by faith, if we're walking by our own power, our own mm -hmm. wisdom, our own whatever, instead of deferring to Jesus, I have died and yet I live. Jesus Christ lives in me. So yeah. um, that's, that's the bottom line. So that, but then we need to check other things too. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest challenges that Jesus had with all of the Jews, including his own disciples, was for them to get the idea that the gospel wasn't just for Jews, that he intended for the gospel to go to everybody. And I thought we should look at some of the evidence, some of the things that Jesus did to try to convince his disciples and later the rest of us through their writings that the gospel is not just for Jews. Can you think of some examples? Very early in his, yeah, go ahead. We can read them. <laughs> yeah, okay, well very early in his ministry he traveled through Samaria, remember? The most direct route from Jerusalem to Nazareth and up to Capernaum was through Samaria. Why didn't the Jews go that way all the time? Because there were Samaritans there. Because there were Samaritans there and they didn't want to make anything to do with them. And you remember John chapter 4, uh, and this is very early in Jesus' experience. He was going through that route. I don't, for whatever reason, he must have been in a hurry. And then there, well, he knew. I think he, he probably went that way because he knew what the Father already told him what was going to happen there. And that, met that woman at the well of Sychar and ended up spending several days with those Samaritans. So that should have been a, a, a hint to the disciples. What, what, what is the next thing that happens chronologically? In the middle of his Galilean ministry, what happened? Healing the demoniacs. He took a boat. He, it's, it's evening, okay? He gets in a boat with his disciples and says he's really tired. He says, sail across the sea. Well, now, I mean, think about it. These are a bunch of Jews. They're, li they're, they're, go they're living in Jewish territory. They're traveling across to basically Gentile territory, although there are, of course, lots of Jews that lived over there, but it's Gentile territory. They're leaving one do domain, going um, in terms of, of who is in charge, to another domain, and Jesus says, let's go. And so they went. And they got to the other side, and what happened? He got out of the boat and he hardly started up the hill and here come these two, one or two demoniacs, depending on whether you follow Matthew's version of the story or, or Luke's or Mark's. But, uh, and they spent, and of course he cast out the demons and put them in the, in the, threw them into the pigs. And then he told those two men to do what? Go tell what great things God has done. Go tell everybody around the wonderful things that have happened to you. These were technically the very first Gentile missionaries. Now we don't often think about it. Formerly demon-possessed people were the first Gentile missionaries. And what happened By when... That, are you meaning missionary to the Gentiles or Gentiles that were missionaries? I mean both. Both, yeah. And... Um, do, you know, do we know for sure that, that they were not Jews? 
Well, I guess I can't say that for sure, no. They could have been you, Jews. We, we assume, okay. We sort of assume, yeah. Later, Jesus came back to that territory, and what happened? It was a great company. Yes. A huge crowd, thousands of people came out to hear him because of the testimony of those two men. So they were a lot more successful than most of us in spreading the gospel, weren't they? What I find interesting is that um, when Jesus is outside of Jewish territory, after his miracles, he might say, go and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Tell others about it. When he's in Jewish territory, yeah. he says, don't tell anyone. Why do you suppose that is? Persecution possibility. Well, okay. His time had not yet come, so he didn't want to stir up the opposition of the and uh, the Romans and, and the Jew, Jewish leaders so that he would, because the crucifixion wasn't to be yeah. until three okay. and a half years later. But I, think there's, I think there's an important point that's behind both of what you've said. Probably that, the, the instruction not to tell anybody was not much of a deterrent. To <laughs> no, <tell>. that's also <laughs> true. They went and told everybody. I think the real reason why he told them that is because if he said to them, I am the Messiah, something like that, they would have gone away with the completely wrong idea what the Messiah was going, to, was going to do. That was not his message. That was not his message. So when he was saying, don't tell anybody, he was saying, I think, if you had the right idea about what the Messiah was going to do, it would be fine. But you have a completely wrong idea about what the Messiah is going to do. So please don't mess things up. So did the Gentiles have the correct idea then? Well, the at, at, at least they were not... Gentiles weren't so set on the idea that Messiah was going to come and make the Jews rule the world. So there were no threat. Yeah. Yeah. How much did Gentiles know about the Messiah? Well, we're talking about ones that Jesus actually healed and so forth, but I mean, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, take the ones that lived in Perea on the other side of the Jordan River there. There were Jews that lived among them, so they must, they probably knew something about the Messiah. But those those din demoniacs, they, um, all they could tell was what happened to them. Yeah. There wouldn't be any deep no. theology in no, that. No. This man showed up and did all this stuff, and so that's their message. Ellen White has some interesting comments about that. I didn't know whether she should miss, mention them or not, but she says that two things that I, one, one thing she says and one thing I have a question about. The first thing she says, those 2,000 pigs that raced down the hill and drowned were actually owned by Jews. Yeah. <laughs> and the next question I have is this. If you're a faithful Jew and believe what they believe about pork and pigs, would you dare to even drink the water out of the Sea of Galilee for the <laughs> next year or so after 2,000 pigs have drowned in it? Or eat the fish. Or eat the fish for that matter. Okay, well, let's move on. That's not our subject for today. So, for the last six months of Jesus' public ministry, and many people haven't picked this up, Jesus traveled almost exclusively in Samaritan and Perean, non-Jewish areas, carrying out his ministry there. So, he traveled up to Tyre and Sidon, across to Caesarea Philippi, and then down into areas on the other side of the Jordan. So, the last six months of his life, he he repeated many of his previous uh, stories and miracles and things that have been done in, in Galilee. He repeated them now in, in non-Jewish territories. Now, there were a lot of Jews there. I'm not saying there were no Jews there, but it was, they were officially Gentile territories. Then after his resurrection, he told his disciples, you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Do you think they had any idea what in the world he was talking about when he said that? Yes. <laughs> well, after Stephen's mighty speech, now how much longer was that? How much later was it Stephen's speech compared to the death of Jesus? Three and a half years. How do you know that? Because in the middle of the week prophesied in Daniel, the Messiah was cut off, and mm -hmm. at the end of the seven years, the gospel was no longer exclusively to the Jews. It not only fits historically, but it fits the prophecy, doesn't it? So then Stephen gave his mighty speech and immediately a terrible persecution started out against Christians and they scattered. And they went to all kinds of places and what do you think the Christians did when they went to new places? 
they spread the word, but they spread the word to Jews only. Well, the next thing that happens chronologically, Peter, Peter was sent by God to the home of Cornelius. Remember that story? A Roman centurion who was already interested in the Jewish religion, and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay? Then the next thing happened chronologically. The brethren in Jerusalem were ready to condemn Peter for what he had done. However, after hearing how the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Cornelius and his family, they accepted the idea that God was ready to welcome Gentiles as Christians. So they immediately went out and started evangelizing Gentiles, right? Nope. Nope. <laughs> they certainly didn't. Then, incredible, and I want to just read um, these verses. Very interesting. Look at Acts chapter 11. I can get my cursor to come over here, wherever it got lost. There it is. Um, and I'm going to start from verse 19. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which take, took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, that would be modern Lebanon, Cyprus, who know the island out there, and Antioch, and that's used to be Syria, but it's now in Turkey, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who are from Cyprus and Cyrene, where's, where's Cyrene located? Libya. Libya. In Libya. So the first official efforts by Christians to evangelize Gentiles were from Libyan missionaries to Syria. <laughs> Try to think about that in, in modern terms. You know, missionaries come from Libya. Christian missionaries from Libya go to Syria and begin spreading the gospel. Well, they, hmm? the man who carried the cross for Jesus, was yep. also from that area. Yeah. Yep. Well, they began pre preaching the good news about the Lord Jesus. That the Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. What was the response? What happened next? Under the direction of the brethren in Jerusalem, Barnabas went to Antioch to explore the huge growth of the church there. And the church saying, what's going on up there in Antioch? Later he traveled to Tarsus, this is Barnabas, and recruited Paul to help him in growing the church. It's just a short distance across the sea and not that far by land from, from Antioch over to Tarsus. After working in Antioch for about a year, Paul and Barnabas, directed by God and anointed by the church, the church in Antioch, set out on their first missionary journey to intentionally evangelize Gentiles as well as Jews in Asia Minor. Now this was craziness, you know. Then hearing about the work Paul and Barnabas had been doing, some men from the party of the Pharisees went from Jerusalem to Antioch insisting that Gentiles must follow all the Jewish practices, including circumcision, before they can become Christians. And what was the result? Actually, I should have added maybe in there, Paul and Barnabas came back and told about the wonderful success they'd had evangelizing Gentiles, and now all of a sudden the Pharisaical leaning Christians said, well, wait, 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 hold on, you know, we could end up having more Gentiles in the church than we have Jews in the church. What a dreadful thought. Isn't that a little bit, I could kind of understand them saying that they need to learn the stuff mm -hmm. and need to become like Jews because it's, it's a little bit like being baptized without go, going to a baptismal class. Yeah. And that's, that's the basic issue that we're going to talk about in the book of Galatians. What do you really need to do to be a true Christian? That's the, mm -hmm. that's the basic question in this, this, whole, this whole book. Ken, well, yeah. you asked the question earlier, um, well, what did Jesus do in this? Mm -hmm. Every time this comes up, I think of the woman in Tyre mm -hmm. who said even the dogs get the crumbs from under the children's table. Mm -hmm. So what was he saying there? I mean, she was a Gentile. Mm -hmm. Not only that, she was one of the ancient Canaanite yeah, group. from Tyre. Yeah. I mean, so... I mean, first he says no, mm -hmm. and she argues with him, and he says, okay, because of your faith, but that's not as direct as yeah. the other stories about Gentiles. Yeah. 
Ellen White helps with that, that a lot. She says, she explains that. He says, you know, it, um, among the Jews in those days, there were two kinds of dogs. The common kinds of dogs lived outside. They never came inside. They were, you know, more or less mongrels running the streets and whatnot. But there were occasionally dogs who actually lived inside and with, with the children and so forth like this. And so when Jesus says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table, he's talking about those dogs who live inside the house and have those special privileges. And she immediately recognized, oh, he's not calling me one of those outside dogs. He's calling me a lap dog, basically. Okay. And so he, she recognized immediately. And Jesus obviously knew that she was going to read between the lines. So, yes. You started this whole list by saying, here's what Jesus did. Yeah. Do yeah. we have any records of Jesus actually saying, other than you will go to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, do we have any actual teachings of Jesus to the disciples, trying to convince them directly that they should tear down those walls of prejudice and go to the Gentiles? Well, you can review everything he did with the Samaritans, for example. When that woman came and said, you know, come to our, even the people said, come and tell us, there was no hesitation at all. Jesus said, yeah, sure. I'm not sure how the disciples felt. By the way, that was even before he had a regular group of disciples. We don't even know how many disciples were with him when that happened. Mm -hmm. And then there's a story about the two men, the two demoniacs, ex-demoniacs, who'd gone out to preach themselves. But, but those things might have just happened, the yeah. disciples would say. Did he actually, did they actually hear him say, you need to tear down your prejudice okay. against the Gentiles. Okay, I, I can, two more things I can say. One, he clearly preached to the Gentiles when the time he fed the 4,000. He preached to them for three days. And then later, well, we don't recognize this, when he sent out the 72, he sent them out to Gentile territory. And those must absolutely had to include the disciples. I'm sure the 72 were not completely separate from the 12. I'm sure the 12 were part of the 72, 70 or 72 documents disagree on whether it was 70 or 72. But when he sent them out, they were going to Gentile territory. Mm -hmm. So There is also the situation where the Greeks came yeah. right before the crucifixion and they wanted to see Jesus. Mm -hmm. and he, uh, I, yeah. I can't remember the exact expression, but he, John 12. Yeah. yeah. So he uh, accepted them as, yeah. as, oh, there it is, yeah. Um, well, anyway, he uh, yeah. expressed it in a positive way yeah. that this was a good thing. Yeah. That this was, well, actually, now that I'm starting to think about it, um, he spoke of the grain of wheat falling into mm -hmm. the ground. And, uh, and then le less it dies, but if it dies, it, uh, a great crop comes up. Yeah. So it's almost like he's uh, tying that in with these two griefs. Yeah, yeah. Well, after returning to Ephesus, going back to Paul's story now, af at the end of his second missionary journey, he's on his third one now, working there for three years, Paul traveled to Corinth. And dealing with the problems at Corinth and later with the problems in Galatia and Rome, Paul made it absolutely clear that Gentiles would be accepted by God on the basis of faith alone and not on the basis of following any Jewish practices. And uh, we'll have an opportunity maybe to talk about that sometime in the future. But if you want to get ahead of the story, read 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 and Romans 14. And you need to put that together with Galatians 3. So the story of Saul or Paul's conversion is told three times. And who is the one who tells the story three times? Paul himself, right? This is a very personal experience. And um, there's interesting comparisons of those three accounts, which are slightly different. What do you think of Paul's method of converting, I mean, God's method of converting Paul? Was he using force on him? Sort of knocked him off, knocked him down, didn't he? Isn't that force? <laughs> with the brakes on him, okay. He leveled the playing field for a short time. <laughs> he leveled the playing field. He was confronting him with the truth that he may have been wondering about. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, nothing in the text says that he used force against him. No. 
Uh, all we know is that he fell to the ground. Yeah. That doesn't mean that God threw him to the ground yeah. in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he could have just been stunned and like any of us, yeah. being blinded, uh, what happened? That, that's kind of force, isn't it? Well, being blinded uh, was to carry a symbolic message as well. But don't we have incidences in our life, you know, that we think oh, we had an accident or something, and it gives you time to think, and you reflect, and you go, okay, maybe there's something else going on here, or maybe I need to change the way I look at it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but there's a story about a man who owned a donkey. I, actually, it was a mule, and he sold it to He said, this mule really works well, he's a powerful mule and so forth, and he sold it to another man. He says, this, this, uh, this is a marvelous mule and so forth. So the other guy gets him and he shouts at the mule and he does, pokes him and, does, and the mule, mule will not move. So he calls the guy up, he says, what's going on here? This mule, I can't get him to do anything. So the guy says, oh, I'll be right over. So he comes over, he takes a two by four and he whacks the mule on the head and then he starts doing it. He says, what was that? He says, I was just getting his attention. <laughs> you know, maybe that's kind of what Paul, God was doing with Paul here. God of extreme. <laughs> well, I well, wonder how many people would respond to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I would respond to it, but, you know, we read about Elijah when he mm -hmm. called fire down from heaven, didn't really convert anything, and yet this big miracle happened. Yeah. And then with Paul, you know, this thing happened and he was converted. So there must have been something going on before that even happened. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, he'd been walking 140 miles thinking about what's going on in his conscience. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and do we know that he was really converted at that point when it yeah. took him another three, and a, three years or so to really accept the message? So he must have done some thinking for some time here. Yeah. Remember that a young man like him being admitted to Sanhedrin had probably memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. So think about the change of mind that had to yeah. take place in... <laughs> he had to go through that whole Old Testament and rethink his understanding of everything that was there. The sermon by the Stephen had to have had some yeah. impact oh, on him. Yeah. To, if somebody take all those stories and put them into something that was cohesive and made sense to him. Okay, well, here's what Ellen White says about that experience in Damascus. The writ of the Sanhedrin, that's the authority of the Sanhedrin, ran wherever there were Jews. Paul had heard that certain of the Christians had escaped to Damascus, and he asked for letters of credit that he might go to Damascus and extradite them. So he was going to do what? He was going to take them back to Jerusalem, right? The journey only made matters worse. It was about 140 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus. The journey would be made on foot and would take about a week. Paul's only companions were the officers of the Sanhedrin, a kind of police force. Because, and I think I made a mistake, didn't I say Ellen White? This is not from Ellen White, this is from the Daily Study Bible. Because he was a Pharisee, he could have nothing to do with them. So he walked alone, and as he walked, he thought, because there was nothing else to do. So, was, would you say God was being, being gentle with Paul or Saul? Didn't Paul deserve, I mean, he, remember, he was killing Christians. Shouldn't God have punished him at that point? Definitely restrained him. <laughs> restrained him. Well, one of the interesting points is, as we look back, we say God judged him not on the basis of what he'd done in the past, but on the basis of what he knew he was going to do in the future, right? How does God conduct his judgment at the end of this world's history? Isn't that the same story? Hopefully. Is that what it says in Matthew 25 and Matthew 7? Hmm. Isn't it what you did? Yeah. Is that it's because... The, the words Jesus, Jesus says, the words he has spoken are going to be their judge. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's in the past tense. So Those who are admitted to heaven will be judged in the same way, not on the basis of what their past behavior, but on the basis of what God knows it will be in the future. So let's just, let's just think about that for a second. Could God allow into heaven anyone that he knew was going to start the rebellion all over again. 
Doesn't matter what their past history was, he could not allow someone into heaven that he knows is going to just start the whole great controversy all over again. Well, if he screws up, well then he can start over again and just <laughs> everything yeah. in the future is going to be fine. <laughs> You're saying that his character wouldn't allow him to do it, no. do it that way, just because of who he is and... Well, I, I mean, the Bible says this is a one-time, the great controversy is a one-time event. God's not going to take any, not going to risk the possibility of going it, through the whole thing. Or is it a last-time event? Uh, that the that first time, because uh, I think it's happened more than once. Uh, uh, said several, you know, what we call this story of Genesis is a story of recreation. You read Genesis 1, 2, it says that the earth became a chaos. Mm -hmm. So, and now you can have a place to put uh, the war in heaven. Wasn't that a great controversy? It's the yeah. same one occurring. Yeah, but, that it, but it's a, re a retelling story from a... It's adding, a recurrent, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's... Uh, I mean... Oh, well, we have in the, in the well, Revelation, tw I think, two times it says there would be no more death. Yeah. That's the only, th the only thing I can think of that uh, gives us some finality to the... Yeah. To the yeah, but think of how many times Satan thought he had just about I mean Egypt, and then Esther, and then just before Jesus is born, he thought, "Man, I just about got this wrapped up. Just I'm just that close." And that's bang, a, that's the difference between the finite and the infinite. Yeah, huh. yeah. That's one thing we fail to recognize too much is is the omniscience of of mm -hmm. God. He knows in advance. He knows in advance what our hearts are going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it seems like we're awfully worried about behavior here, even in the future. I mean, because well, only anybody that, that, yeah. that's in favor of God, how can they be, how can they be um, dispatched mm -hmm. if they're in favor of God? He's I mean, I'm in back. favor. I'm in favor of God right now, but I'm I'm sure not perfect. Yeah. I. Well, the, my, and that's why uh, I say the question is. Fortunately, God can look into the future. If He knows that you're going to cause a lot of trouble in the future, He just can't take you to heaven. Well, that's true. But um, how am I going to feel that I won't do something wrong in heaven? Yeah. Well, but unless yeah. unless I am convinced that I'm in favor of God, yeah. The one thing you could become convinced that about is God. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we could be all that convinced about ourselves and what we will do, but we could trick it to the point where we could just trust God's judgment call. Mm -hmm. That's one way to look at it. Yeah. Perfect yeah. love casts out fear. So yeah. once we <coughs> encounter perfect love, that. I think that fear that you have of, am I going to fail, uh, will go away also. Is it the fear, or will I not, so or will I be perfect after that? Where does this you equate with the statement, depart from me, I never knew you? Yeah, where does Matthew that 7, yeah. yeah. But where does it fit? I, I thought about that today when I read the notes. I thought that almost sounds like there's going to be one big old line of all kinds of folks there. Mm-hmm. Well, can we be absolutely sure of some of our beliefs and at the same, at the same time be absolutely wrong? Paul was. Well, we know in part and we prophesy in part. Mm -hmm. So even though the part we have may be correct as we try to fit it into other areas, we may be wrong about mm -hmm. something else. We may be so hard-headed about what it is that is right that we run over other truths that yeah. that we just aren't willing to. There's accept. a five hundred years after Martin Luther, mm -hmm. he was absolutely convinced that he was right, and we're pretty sure he was wrong about a couple things at least. <laughs> yep. And we're still here to prove that that's true. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's a famous French philosopher and mathematician by the name of Blaise Pascal who once wrote, "Men never do evil so completely and cheerfully." as when they do it from a religious conviction. Mm -hmm. And others have said, it, historians have said, more wars have been fought in the name of religion than for any other reason. Well, Saul, and Paul, Saul or Paul is an example of the fact that God would rather have us be misguided but zealous for what we believe so long as our minds are open 
than to have us apathetic and not willing to put ourselves out for anything. To which category do we belong? Are we a part of Laodicea? Does that remind you of any words? Paul would absolutely not fit in Laodicea. See Revelation 3, 14 to 22 if you want to review what that says. So how can we be fully convinced and zealous about our beliefs and at the same time be humble in the face of truth? That's a, that's a, that's a challenge. Question. That's a challenge. Well, Damascus was an ancient love, city. Love would be the answer yeah. because in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2, he says uh, that and if any man thinks he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to have known. For knowledge puffs up, but mm -hmm. love edifies. Mm -hmm. It's not against knowledge, but uh, knowledge can puff us up and, and forget how to love. Well, Paul went into the city of Damascus. We know how he went to the house of Judas. We know almost nothing about that person, but Ellen White says he was a believer. Then Ananias came to him three days later and baptized him, apparently, and he became, began preaching the good news to the synagogues there in Damascus. Then he left for a period of about three years, went out in the desert thinking things over. Then he came back to Damascus so powerful in his preaching that the Jews wanted to kill him. And they had to let him down, the Christians had to let him down secretly to a window in the wall. And you may know that Damascus is, claims to be the oldest continuously have inhabited city in the world. And I have a picture of part of the wall, if you can see it. I don't know, that's kind of small, but you can see that there was a pretty high wall there and there are windows in the wall. Um, but anyway, so they apparently let Paul down through one of those kind of windows. And uh, where did he go? Off to Arabia, what? No, this is after oh, that. After he, went, he went to Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah. And what do you think he, can you imagine Paul now? He's coming back to Jerusalem. Somewhere he has a wife and maybe a family. We just don't know. He's coming back to face the Sanhedrin, all his best buddies that he left with the intention of bringing all those terrible Christians back to Jerusalem. And Gamaliel. And Gamaliel. And he's, he, he wants to get together with the Christians who don't trust him for a moment. What's he coming to? He's going to have to do some sort of switch or change or <laughs> Well, to just get a little idea more about Damascus, Damascus is believed to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. Josephus said that it was founded by one of the sons of Shem, maybe. At the time Saul, Paul went there, there were an estimated 10 to 18,000 Jews living in Damascus. That's just Jews. And this, remember, is not in Judean territory. A few years later, Nero butchered 10,000 Jews in Damascus alone. No doubt the Christian believers in Damascus were still worshiping in the 30 to 40 synagogues uh, in Damascus at the time. So the Christians, despite their differences with the Jews, were probably still worshiping still in the synagogues. I think you said somewhere in the handout that there were estimated to be 500,000 inhabitants of Damascus at the time? At that point, at that time. So Half million. 10 to 18,000 Jews out of 500,000. Uh, Damascus, it was, turns out, was, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about Antioch. It's, it's Antioch that had 500,000, I think, wasn't it? Could be. It was the third largest city in the Roman yes. Empire after Roman. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. A few, bunch of questions now for you to think about in our last few minutes. Which do you think would have been more shocking to the average Christian or Jew in Damascus in those days? One, that Saul, Paul was the persecuting Pharisee had become a Christian, or two, that God intended for the gospel to go to the Gentiles. You don't have to answer. Just you out there, think, try to decide for yourself. Almost immediately, Saul, Paul began to proclaim Jesus. A little while later, he retreated into the deserts of Arabia to think things through. Then he returned to Damascus and began to preach the gospel with a vigor and with a deep conviction about the truth. The Jews became so upset they intended to kill him, but he was let down over the wall at night in a basket and fled to Jerusalem. 
So where do you think Paul went when he got to Jerusalem? He said he went to visit Cephas. Well, finally what happened is Barnabas accepted him and Barnabas took him to, now you're talking about Cephas, that was a later, a later time he went to Cephas, that was a later visit. Um, and the Christians recognized, and I'm sure he must have gone to the synagogue and started preaching Jesus, and pretty, pretty quickly the Christians realized that this guy sticks around here, they're going to kill him. And so where did he go then? Back home. Back home to Tarsus in Cilicia. And probably he traveled in that area, Cilicia, maybe over into Syria, even as far as Damascus, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not Damascus, as far as Antioch, preaching the gospel. We don't know what he did during those years, probably maybe five years. Uh, so that now we, we've come to the point where he has become a church member in the city of Antioch. We've already suggested that Antioch was the place where um, Christians were first called <coughs> Christians. Why were they called Christians? people that followed that dead man. Yeah, this is, these are the crazy people who think that a dead man's going to save them, right? I've already mentioned that Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire in those days after Rome and, and Alexandria in Egypt. Um, we've already talked about how these people from Cyrus and Cyrene came and, and um, evangelized things. So, Paul and Barnabas worked there for a while, evangelizing Jews and Gentiles, and then the church anointed them, and what did, what did they do? They went out on their first missionary journey, and where did they go? Well, believe it or not, if you understand a little bit about geography, they actually went along, they went through several other places in the process of going. They went through Cyprus, and they went up across into um, what now would be modern Turkey, but one of the places, the places where they ended up was actually southern Galatia. The cities of Lystra and Derby and so forth. Um, now there's a big argument among scholars, and we're not going to concern ourselves with it, uh, about whether or not this letter from Paul was written to the churches in northern Galatia, whether it was written to churches in southern Galatia, it doesn't matter. I'm sure that all the Galatians got the message sooner or later. Um, anyway, from after evangelizing so many people out in Gentile territory, they caused that big stir that resulted in the necessity for the Jerusalem Conference. And what happened in the Jerusalem Conference? There's some very interesting verses that introduce us to that conference. Look at the first five verses of Acts 15. Uh, actually, let me. Some men came to Judea, to, from Judea to Antioch, and started teaching the believers, "You cannot be saved unless you are circumcised, as the law of Moses requires." Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this, so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. They went. They were sent on their way by the church, and as they went through Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God. This news brought great joy to all the believers. Um, I wonder about the all the believers. <laughs> when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, to whom they told all that God had done through them. But some of the believers, now when we say believers, what group are we talking about? Christians. Christians who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. I want you to think about this for a moment. Here's a group of Christians having a fierce argument, and the fiercest opponents on both sides are? Pharisees. Pharisees. <laughs> well, this is Saul's, Paul's old buddies. Yeah. Just arguing with him. That's kind of expected, though, isn't it? Yeah, probably. So, um, what was the conclusion? Do you remember? 
Remember they, they gave that decree at the end of that discussion in Acts 15 saying, you know, you, there's four things you have to do. And, and the four things have nothing to do with the gospel. The four things have to do with whether or not you can go to church on Sabbath and sit next to a Jew without him raising a fit. That's what that was all about. So it's how to get along with people, not how to be saved. Yeah. Well, how to get along with Jews. <laughs> well, there's an unfortunate story that's a sequel to that many years later when Paul came back to Jerusalem. Uh, maybe the third or fourth time, I don't know how many times he came back to Jerusalem. And the Christian believers at that point said, uh, and I, let me just read this. This is from Acts of the Apostles. The whole story starts on page 400 up to 405. Many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel ch still cherished a regard for the ceremonial law and were only too willing to make unwise concessions. Hoping thus to gain the confidence of their countrymen, that would be other Jews, to remove their prejudice and to win them to faith in Christ as the world's redeemer. Now what were they doing to win those people? And now they're trying to get Paul to concede, to give up some of his beliefs so it'll be easier for them. Paul realized that so long as many of the leading members of the church, the leading members of the church at Jerusalem, should continue to cherish prejudice against him, they would work, work constantly to counteract his influence. He felt that if by any reasonable concession he could win them to the truth, he would remove a great obstacle to the success of the gospel in other places. But he was not authorized of God to concede as much as they asked. What does that tell you? Peer pressure. Paul is trying to get them to accept the idea that the gospel needs to go to the Gentiles and the church leaders ended up, as a result, Paul ended up getting imprisoned and, and, you know, and that was really the beginning of the end for his ministry. Well, Ellen White had some trouble with church leadership in her days too, didn't she? Could that ever happen again? Hmm. Well, friends, you and I need to think about the experience of Paul. We need to study and study and study and be so convinced of the truth that nothing can deviate us from God's plan for our lives. Our kind and wonderful Father, we look at this experience of Paul and what a fiery zealot he was on both sides, and before and after Damascus. We wonder how often or how, how it could be possible for us in our day, with all the evidence we have before us, to be wrong about the truth. And sometimes we just openly say we have the truth. And I guess the real question should be, does the truth have us? Do we really study? Do we really understand everything you have tried to teach us through the generations? We know that we are now almost 173 years after the great disappointment, and we're still here. So there's still work to be done, and that work must begin in our hearts. May it begin today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.